reason to allow their impaired vision to call into question what we see clearly. Thus, the existence of objective moral values serves to demonstrate the existence of God. Or consider the nature of moral obligation. What makes certain actions right or wrong for us? Why is it that we ought to do certain things and we ought not to do other things? Where does this ought come from? If we deny God's existence, then it's difficult to make sense of moral obligation or right and wrong. As Richard Taylor explains, the idea of political obligation or legal obligation is clear enough. Similarly, the idea of an obligation higher than this and referred to as moral obligation is clear enough provided reference to some lawmaker higher than those of the state is understood. In other words, he says, our moral obligations can be understood as those that are imposed by God. This does give a clear sense to the claim that our moral obligations are more binding upon us than our political obligations. But, Taylor says, what if this higher than human moral lawgiver is no longer taken into account? Does the concept of moral obligation still make sense? He answers, the concept of moral obligation is unintelligible apart from the idea of God. The words remain, but their meaning is gone. It follows that moral obligations and right and wrong necessitate God's existence. And certainly we do have such moral obligations. Speaking recently on a Canadian university campus, I noticed a poster put up by the Sexual Assault and Information Center. It read, sexual assault. No one has the right to abuse a child, woman, or man. Now, most of us recognize that that statement is evidently true. But the atheist can make no sense of a person's right not to be sexually abused by another. The best answer as to the question of the source of moral obligation is that moral rightness and wrongness consists in agreement or disagreement with the will or commands of a holy and loving God. Finally, take the problem of moral accountability. Here, we find a powerful practical argument for believing in God. According to the philosopher William James, practical arguments can be used only when theoretical arguments are insufficient to decide a question of urgent and pragmatic importance. But it seems to me obvious that a practical argument could also be used to back up or to motivate the acceptance of the conclusion of a sound theoretical argument. To believe then that God does not exist and that there is thus no moral accountability would be quite literally demoralizing. For then we should have to believe that our moral choices are ultimately insignificant, since both our fate and that of the universe will be the same regardless of what we do. By demoralization, I mean a deterioration of moral motivation. It's hard to do the right thing when that means sacrificing your own self-interest or to resist temptation when desire is strong. And the belief that ultimately it doesn't matter what you choose or do is apt to sap one's moral strength and so undermine one's moral life. As Oxford philosopher Robert Adams observes, having to regard it as very likely that the history of the universe will not be good on the whole, no matter what one does, seems apt to induce a cynical sense of futility about the moral life, undermining one's moral resolve and one's interest in moral considerations. By contrast, there's nothing so likely to strengthen the moral life as the belief that one will be held accountable for one's actions and that one's choices do make a difference in bringing about the good. Theism is thus a morally advantageous belief 
And this, in the absence of any theoretical argument establishing atheism to be the case, provides practical grounds to believe in God and motivation to accept the conclusions of the two theoretical arguments that I just gave. In summary then, theological foundations do seem to be necessary for morality. If God does not exist, then it's plausible to think that there are no objective moral values, no objective moral duties, and no moral accountability. The horror of such a morally neutral world is obvious. On the other hand, if we hold, as it seems rational to do, that objective moral values and duties do exist, then we have good grounds for believing in the existence of God. In addition, we have powerful practical reasons for believing in God in view of the morally bracing effects which belief in moral accountability produces. In conclusion, then, we cannot truly be good without God. But if we can, in some measure, be good, then it follows logically that God exists.